All right, looks like folks are coming in. Welcome everyone, welcome. Thank you everyone for showing up today to our webinar on medical psilocybin for cluster headaches. Uh, this is webinar six out of our, it's gonna be an eight webinar series. Uh, as we campaign and advocate for legal access to psilocybin through psilocybin regulations. So welcome back. Uh, for those of you who have been following all of our other webinars, uh, we've had amazing webinars with palliative patients, patients in remission. Uh, we did Veterans Week last week and this week we are on uh, the medical psilocybin for cluster headaches webinar. So thank you very much for joining. Uh, this is today a joint webinar with OPUS, the Organization for the Prevention of Intense Suffering. And we've got Jonathan on the call who will introduce uh, what we're doing with that partnership and tell you a bit more about OPUS in a moment. So it looks like we've got about 20 participants in here, which is great. Uh, it would be amazing if everyone um, could maybe type in where you're coming from today. It's amazing to see where, where folks are tuning in from. Uh, so feel free to throw that in the chat box. And then just for a bit of housekeeping, there's also a Q&A box. And that Q&A box uh, is where you can put some questions and we'll have myself and Holly and I think the other panelists will be able to monitor that. So if there's something you wanna ask us, just make sure it goes again in that Q&A box. Uh, so let's get started here. And first and foremost, um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm conducting this Zoom uh, from Victoria. And this is the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Songhees, the Squamal, and the Sand people. Furthermore, I would like to acknowledge uh, that as we're working to legalize psilocybin therapy in Canada, we do acknowledge that this whole field um, wouldn't exist without the Indigenous knowledge keepers um, from whom we first began using psilocybin. So thank you. So let's go through today's webinar. Um, and I think that the best way to go through the webinar is just to explain that we've got a huge panel here um, with a bunch of different doctors. Uh, we've got a patient who's used psilocybin um, to cluster bust. And then we've also got Jonathan from Opus too. So I think the best way to do this is let's just go through the speakers today for a really quick introduction before we get to all of our parts and speak a bit more. So uh, to start off, um, Dr. Brian McGinney, uh, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about who you are? Hi, folks. Uh, glad to be here. Um, I'm a neurologist, a clinician, a headache medicine specialist, and a longtime advocate in headache medicine, and also, and in particular, a cluster headache, and an advisor to the national organization Cluster Busters in, in, in the United States, uh, which I'm honored uh, to be a, a part of in some way. Um, and so, I spent my time and my practice and my career trying to improve the lives of people in headache medicine. And that uh, brings me here. Thank you so much, Brian. And we've got Dr. John Halpern on the call as well. John, over to you for an introduction. I'm muted. Thank you. So greetings all. Um, my name's John Halpern. I'm a physician also and psychiatrist and uh, researcher of psychedelics and as well, and uh, remain quite active in various aspects of, of, of that, but primarily involved with clinical care at this point. And um, it was my lab's work with um, psilocybin and, and LSD in cluster headache um, that got published. So I know a lot about uh, why um, there really are some uh, medicinal properties to the to psilocybin that are worth exploring and um, are are important when it comes to cluster headache and of course it's really good to see my good good friend uh, Dr. McGinney too who's underselling himself because there's not many many neurologists who accept headache patients and um, focus on headache and we need. There's not enough neurologists and psychiatrists in general in North America, but to have somebody who is friendly and positive and an expert on, on headache and cluster headache, I wish I could clone Brian McKinney. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. And over to Ainsley Kors. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ainsley Kors. I am a cluster patient. 
I'm also a very proud board member of the Cluster Busters organisation. Um, I have had Cluster Headaches for close to 37 years now. Um, I'm coming to you today from Glasgow in Scotland. And um, like Dr Halpern, I also wish we could clone Dr Brian McGinney. He's a wonderful <laughs> um, addition and a great friend to many of us and a particularly great friend to Cluster Busters. So I'm very proud to have him on board with us and very proud to be here today. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Ainsley. And Jonathan, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks to all the participants, uh, well, to the attendees for joining. So yeah, my name is Jonathan Layton. Um, I'm the executive director of Opus, which is a small think and do tank that I founded uh, about five years ago. Uh, I'm a molecular biologist by training, and I also write about ethics. I've just finished my second book uh, about ethics, really looking at the big picture and what matters. And Opus was set up basically to put the focus on intense suffering and to promote the idea that preventing intense suffering from happening should be the highest priority of our society. So one of the main areas of focus until now has been uh, trying to facilitate access to effective medication for patients in severe pain. Uh, we've done some work with morphine. I can tell you more about that later. And since last year, we've been focusing on cluster headaches as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And thank you very much for helping us put this entire uh, webinar together. I, I really appreciate it. It's been great working with you. And myself, I'm Spencer Hawkswell. Uh, I'm the CEO at Theracil and our organization uh, is helping to get Canadians legal access to psilocybin. Um, and this whole campaign is to work on regulations to change that. Um, so without further ado, I think we should jump right into the webinar. Um, and starting with you, Dr. Brian McGinney, it would be great if you could give us an introduction to what exactly cluster headaches are and what are the current treatment options for those. Oh, always a good starting point to make sure we understand what we're talking about. And when we say the term cluster headache, we're not saying people are getting groups of headaches. So that must be cluster. No, cluster headache is a very specific entity. Um, not to be confused with any headaches that occur in groups. No, it's a very specific, very severe, uniformly severe, uncommon headache disorder where the patient experiences recurrent episodes of severe one-sided uh, headache, which would typically last half an hour, an hour or so, but not all day. And then it switches off. And unfortunately, that can recur more than once during the day when this, this is active. It's very, very different to migraine. Um, and fortunately for us, a lot less common than migraine. Um, uh, the, often the patient has other clinical features such as tearing on one side or running nostril just on the one side during the attacks. But I want to emphasize that it's a uniformly severe pain problem. So it's not uncommon for the patient to present in the emergency room or get into a panic and reach out to their primary care or so on and so forth. And because it's uncommon, it tends to be um, diagnosed late. Uh, fortunately, most patients who run into cluster headache, it'll switch off typically for months at a time, it will come occasionally over a period of weeks. We turn, we use the term cluster period, where, which is a period of weeks when the patient is vulnerable to get repeated attacks. Now, the, the, the first big challenge is actually making the diagnosis and not thinking somebody has migraine or some other more common headache type. Um, and we do have treatments and there's, there's a fair amount we can do, but there's also an awful lot we cannot do. And there are treatments around trying to treat the actual attack when it occurs. And there are treatments that try and reduce the number of attacks or knock somebody into submission, into a remission, I should say, not submission. Um, and when an attack occurs, it can go from zero to 60. So no pain to severe pain in a short number of minutes, as I'm sure Ainsley will tell you about uh, shortly. Um, so giving somebody a pill, for instance, ain't gonna do much good because all pills take really 30 minutes to an hour to kick in, two hours full, uh, fully kick in, that's far too late. We have, believe it or not, an injection 
of a now generic medication works well, but unfortunately being an injection, even the generic cost is high, sumatriptan, and high flow oxygen. I stress the high flow with a mask, not a nasal cannulae. Those two outcomes can switch it off in 10 or 15 minutes for most people instead of an hour. Everything else is not as good. And there are lots of other things um, that will attack the, uh, treat the actual attack. And then with respect to how do we get people not to have the attacks in the first place, so-called prophylaxis, we're really wanting for better treatments there, really. And the, our number one go-to agent, um, verapamil, which happens to be an old calcium channel blocker, an old blood pressure medication, very safe. And for some people helpful and others not at all. Uh, but to give you an idea of how limited we were working on, there's only one randomized controlled trial against placebo showing the benefit of, benefit of rapamil. There were only 30 people and eight people had prior experience, which would typically be an exclusion for clinical trials. So we're working on really not good evidence-based medicine. And we do have a recent indication for an injectable monoclonal antibody, incidentally. Um, uh, and which can be of some benefit, but there's an enormous way to go. Um, and part of my interest in this was because of the gap between the needs and treatment options. And that's how I stumbled across the advocacy organizations and how I stumbled across the, uh, the psilocybin and the use of psilocybin by patients. Um, that's not magic. The treatments for a lot of the treatments for headache are, ser are based on activating serotonin receptors, such as the triptans, imitrex, sumatriptan, risotriptan, and even the ergotamines, old uh, headache drugs. Um, and so it so happens that there are naturally occurring agents molecules that act at our serotonin receptors. And one of them is, is, is psilocybin and I'm not sure how much you want me to expand right off, but uh, although we don't, uh, for, John has um, was involved pivotally in bringing this uh, really to, to national attention and international attention as a possible treatment and try and working tirelessly to advocate for evidence-based medicine, which we're slowly accruing. But apart from that, there's extensive anecdotal uh, support um, for psilocybin helping an enormous number of people. Nothing works for everybody. And that applies just as much what we do. But I will say that the sort of outcomes I can see in patients using psilocybin, psilocybin I do not see in any of the, with any of the treatments, the tools that we have in standard medicine. Um, um, whether I should go into it in detail now, but it cannot just switch off um, it can just prevent the attacks, but it can prevent attacks for weeks from a simple one or two day administration, which is really unheard of with our current treatment rationale, which is very intriguing. And I will stress switches off, not switches down or the pain's less, off, zero, zero pain. So there aren't many treatments that are suggested, so-called off-label, that have a zero pain outcome. And this is one of them. Um, questions? I've definitely got a few questions for you here, um, Brian. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if you think it would be more appropriate to ask them now or to go through the speakers. And, and I think what we should do or what we had planned was to go through the speakers and have everyone explain. So I think we'll do that. And then uh, to any of the audience members, if you have any questions on what Brian uh, just spoke about, please feel free to throw those into the Q&A and Holly will make sure that they all get recorded and not forgotten. Um, so yeah, I think what we'll do is pass it over to Dr. John uh, Halpern next to speak about uh, the research on psilocybin for cluster headaches and a bit about your, your own experience, John. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, just because <laughs> my involvement, um, I, um, I, I managed to free up about a half hour for us and um, you know, for any of the others, and I see the dates, if you want me to free up some more time, I will, but, but, but I managed to scroll that away. So I'm really glad to be able to communicate um, with you now. So um, 
the story of, 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 of the use of, of LSD and psilocybin for, for cluster headache is one of patient, patient's dis- self-discovery. And um, people that wouldn't normally be, quote unquote, fans of, you know, taking a hallucinogenic substance. Um, but when you have cluster headache, the desperation of the condition is such that it's a luxury for everybody else to offer their sympathy and to feel for the person. But when you live with this disorder, there's a reason why they're called suicide headaches. It's the only form of headache that people might complete suicide to escape the pain. And from an evolutionary standpoint, I just marvel at that, that we could have a condition that could be quite as exquisitely painful as this. I mean, if I said maybe the worst migrantist patient should think of cluster headache as still being an order of magnitude or more painful than that, I think most people who have he- have migraine would have a really hard time be- even believing it could be like that. But um, it, it it's a desperate thing seeing somebody going berserk they're in so much pain. I mean, it can feel like a hot poker is going uh, periorbitally, you know, like jabbing into your, through your skull, into your brain somehow. You push down, some of pressure can be a little bit of relief. People pull out their hair, bang their heads against the wall to distract them the refractory pain. Ow, I feel that. Because somehow then it distracts them away from the paying attention to just how searingly desperately painful this condition is. And it's that dramatic need that gets my attention, that gets the attention of Dr. McGinney and gets the attention of any legitimate doctor who is concerned about health of patients. Because we do not legislate our drug laws and our social issues on the backs of our patients, right? Even Consider this, even heroin. When heroin was made illegal in the United States, it was such an important medication still for pain that the US, the law said the United States government can gives permission for existing stockpiles to get used up. My father, when he was in a residency in the, in the 1950s and he was delivering a baby, the, the hospital still had heroin. He, he used heroin for the delivery. I was like, what? He goes, look, do you think the pregnant woman after she gave birth became a heroin addict, or she thanked me that she got pain relief that much faster. This is where heroin was great because it, 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 it's, it, believe me, it's an opiate like all the others and can get, all the others can get you high too. And you can get addicted to them too. And sadly, by the way, many cluster headache patients have had histories of opiate dependence. And then they trying to chase that as a means to treat their illness. And it doesn't do a good job. And also when you get really a, hooked on to opiates and then you work on stopping them, you get, um, you can get rebound cluster headaches just from the withdrawal. What a nightmare. It's such a hard condition to live with. So these patients went to neurologists and others saying, hey, LSD, it seems like it helps us. Get some neurologists interested in it. And then, and then uh, they'd run away from it because it's, <laughs> I don't want to do research with a schedule one substance. So they came to me because I had a lab at Harvard devoted to the study of um, hallucinogens in humans. And I, I have to say it was a, quite the meeting. I organized a number of people in leadership at my institution at the time, which was McLean Hospital at Harvard, and basically won over the administration to let us move forward with clinical research. Step one was there's nothing in the literature really about it. So we did an exhaustive um, um, recruitment of cluster headache patients who stated they had tried LSD or psilocybin and gave us permission to get their medical records from their neurologists in which we then documented how the neurologists put in the clinical notes that they have these reports of LSD and psilocybin helping. And, and in that way, we constructed our, our first paper with you know, data on more than 50 people. And then from that um, came um, the unusual detour of what was it LSD and psilocybin? You know, it seems like it was probably something tethered to the psychedelic effects because psilocybin works, LSD works. They're both indole type hallucinogens, but they're different. But the commonality, real commonality, is like well, the psychedelic effect. Well, 
Tuberomo LSD is a, was developed in the 50s to be a LSD, but minus the psychoactive effects. It looks exactly the same as LSD, but at the R2 position, um, a hydrogen atom was replaced with bromine, which is such a huge heavy molecular weight um, atom that it blocks LSD from fitting into 5-HT2A toggling. That's what I think is one of the key essential steps for activating psychedelic, you know, you know, subjective experience. And in fact, tubromo LSD is completely inert. There is no psychoactive effects off of tubromo LSD. So I, you know, can I give 2000 micrograms of LSD though? I don't have to scrape somebody off the ceiling at that dose, but I can give 2000 micrograms, two milligram dose of tubromo LSD and in Germany, under compassionate use exemptions and a whole bunch of things that just have to check out perfectly, because in other words, it usually never happens, but um, we did a study with tubromo LSD for um, um, six people and we published on that in cephalalgia and I think in headache. There's, a, there's also an abstract published there and we presented it at, um, at uh, a couple of the headache focused uh, research um, uh, meetings too, um, and got a whole bunch of like then also the bigger names in neurology to really start thinking about this, um, at least acknowledge it and, and, and not be surprised by it. So yes, I had a great conversation with Dr. Peter Goadsby, or at least he lectured me and asked me some questions. I don't think anybody quite has a normal conversation with them, but it was definitely important to have these types of interactions too. Be and, and so this led to, to, instead of trying to do more research with LSD, that we wanted to develop to bromo LSD. And it almost happened. And I know it works and it's kind of stuck, not developed, which is, unbelievable and that's another whole story about that but it does go show you how important ad patient advocacy can be to change the nature of what it's like to live with this illness we started out ouch was the largest organization in the world i think for cluster headache advocacy and eventually they wound up folding into cluster busters and so we have this one fantastic organization that really wants to advocate anything and everything under the sun that can help cluster headache patients no i've never heard anybody with an agenda other no more pain no more people suffering like this and that's why also this is really important i left it the chance to speak at this because i don't want to see another person die from cluster headache. And if psilocybin and LSD, for example, but especially psilocybin, if that is the way in to get people in, in for legal reform to understand we have to make room for things like this, then you know, I, we need all, everybody who's listening to this to, to, to start stirring it up because the cause is real and people are dying of cluster headache around this world. I'm certain of that. Not everybody knows about this. And so here we are stuck. I can't develop tubromo LSD for the market yet, but everybody now has heard about LSD and psilocybin and can take it uh, under their own control. I do believe as a point of interest that higher doses probably work better than lower doses. There's a lot on the net about sub-psychedelic doses is being effective and i think it's true there's a method we like under the tongue of uh, putting a mushroom cap under the tongue and, and there's reports of even that working and a lot of that is being based on the fact that it can be scary to have a fully psychedelic experience particularly people that you know later in their life they're not emotionally feeling like they want to go through this experience but what are you supposed to do so i think that's what has caused this creative effort to even try if lower doses can be helpful. And if that's a way to get a little bit of relief, then I think that's legitimate as well. But I think that's a point of confusion out there when people start researching this, wondering, gee, do I need little or should I try more? I think if people have a safe set and setting and are prepared and have experience and they've really focused, I mean, the more you put into this type of experience to make it safe, the better the outcome, but if I gave you an amnestic and a hypnotic, I gave you anesthesia and knocked you out, and still then we administered psilocybin to you, I believe it still would work. So think about that too. Anyway, that's my, that's my show. I've 
I'm sorry that I can't participate longer, but I hope that's helpful for everyone. No, it's it's very helpful. And, and I, I do have a, a really, I think, important question here for, for both you and, and Dr. McGinney. Um, listening to both of you, it seems so incredibly clear that this is a very difficult space to get research going. And I, I assume it may be something, it may have to do with the small number of, of people affected or understanding the small amount of literature. You're saying there is nothing. I mean, one of the things that we're, we're battling here in Canada, and, and, and I think I, I really want to hear your perspectives on as doctors, is do you need 10 years of clinical data to treat someone if, if something's working for them? I mean, does medicine only take, ba- or take place on the basis of clinical evidence? Why not self-discovery? I mean, how much of medicine is really hypothesis and, and clinical, clinical work versus exploration and trial? I think of you know, medicines like ketamine, or you were saying the existing treatment for cluster headaches being an old, an old blood pressure medication or, or Viagra. I mean, all of these things came out of, you know, trying off label substances or just trying, trying new substances. So, so what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do we need to have 10 years of clinical data to start helping patients today? Um, so I could go soon. Uh, so Brian, just give me a second. Um, sure, sure, sure. No, you don't need 10 years of data, but you have to have and, and and you know think, you know it's obviously I'm I'm not going to be familiar to the the specifics of Canada's laws, but speaking from what it takes in the United States, it's not the amount of years; it's the quality of the data, and and the expense is getting you know placebo controlled double blind data that can be reproduced by a skeptic. That's that needs to it needs to be like like every other drug that gets developed. And the fear about the 10 year thing, I assure you, in the United States, when it comes to a condition like cluster headache, if we have if we can show in that type of data, even a small study, but it's double blind, there are huge opportunities with the FDA to get accelerated approval status. And cluster headache definitely would qualify for that. But Yes, there has to be admin tox data. There has to be all the things in place, just like for every other substance that gets approved, because we don't offer patent medicines and base it on anecdotal evidence is sufficient because a doctor is practicing on technically until they know the person, a stranger. And so there's standards that we have to live up to. And I don't believe it's as onerous as 10 years, but we do need funding that needs to be proper and it can be very expensive. Um, it can be done on the, on the cheap, but then also that has impact in how well you get penetration of people accepting this. And let's face it, there's a lot of baggage with something that is only primarily known in, in, in our world as a drug of abuse. So a, it can be done. I would ask people to look at how uh, GHB got uh, FDA approval in the United States, gamma hydroxybutyrate, you know, it was called a date rape drug and still illicitly can be, um, people can be arrested for its use, but it's also scheduled um, two and has a centralized pharmacy so the DEA can keep on top of it. And that would be a kind of model that would work for the legal distribution of, of, of psilocybin. Now, the other point of it is you're just saying is, well, once people are just taking things naturalistically and collecting them and growing them and, um, uh, there may be a legal case for d- the defense of such use, but it won't be accepted as, as a, a bona fide medical treatment without that type of validation and proof. And it's it's a it's a question of money. It's a question of 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 having the institutional support, but it's achievable. Um, and that's partially why I went on the route of trying to develop two bromo LSD, a non hallucinogenic combo. Even that got killed off. Uh, by the way, primarily killed off because a hedge fund um, was investing in a new uh, company offering a new generic triptan. And they tied up the development of BOL for two years so that they could see their new triptan copycat get to market. And their $20 million investment realized $200 million at IPO sale. And then they told us, oh, we had no interest in developing you because we would have been a competitor. That's how evil this pharmaceutical development stuff is out there. So thank God we have psilocybin and, and, and LSD now. And people will take its use in their own hands. 
but they run the risk of being arrested and being and, and all the problems of, uh, of you know associated with that just to try to get treated for cluster headache at least for cluster headache patients we have to find a way to accelerate this process that is scary to think that people would think it takes 10 years till you get to be legitimized no we all have to do better than that agreed and and brian anything to add to that well um <clears throat> As you're probably aware that once a treatment is available for any indication, physicians can use it for other. So um, uh, uh, let's say injectable sumatriptan, which is a treatment that, to abort a cluster attack. Um, and that was out by, for migraine long before it became approved or we had evidence for cluster, but you can use it. So if a product is already out for another indication, you can certainly as a physician, um, use it. The, ch the barrier can be insurance coverage or who's going to pay if it's an expensive one. That's the barrier. Um, for instance, high flow oxygen, the barrier in the United States can be who, who pays for it, but it is available. And then with something like psilocybin, of course, is not available. And the path would probably be get it indicated for, for the easiest pathway, a behavioral uh, mood problem, something that's big, uh, lots of patients, uh, but once once there's a pathway for that to be out, it's a lot easier then to access uh, a treatment option. So those concepts of, um, but to, to get the, the kernel of your question is, do we have to wait for lots of evidence-based medicine? We're skiing off piste uh, mostly when treating cluster headache and really in pain disorders, you're often uh, skiing uh, using treatments off label are not the, the not the typical or standard, and that's kind of a norm in headache medicine. Um, uh, but and then you, when you don't have the evidence based medicine, you make the best use of the uh, the case histories and experience you can, and and gradually accrue. But the the evidence will allow often a, a governmental indication, which makes it easier to get reimbursed and to talk about it and to prescribe. Thank you very much, Brian, and, and that makes a lot of sense. I, I see this as particularly, uh, you know, an important use of you know clinical time to, to figure out how we can make it available, perhaps for even just chronic pain. We've seen so many people um, at Theracil using psilocybin to manage their chronic pain, and, and while we don't talk about it, it can manifest itself in many ways, sometimes psychologically, sometimes physical. Uh, I do hope that we can get to that point where it's it's approved for one, so doctors can use it, you know, off label. Yeah, and it's important for us as clinicians to talk about this as a, as, as a chemical, not magic, and its mechanism of action at least is partially understood. Talk about it in terms like we talk about other medications we use. And also stress, as you know well, this is a non-addictive option because so much, so many of the public don't even realize that we're talking about a non-addictive um, agent. Um, and because it's banned, people presume it must be addictive, which is not the case. Nice. Well, thank you so much. And uh, John, I, I realize you, have, you may have to jump off the call soon. So if you've got to head out, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. Thanks, John. Really love talking with you. You betcha. Always. So Ainsley, um, I would love to hear your personal journey about cluster busting. Um, Thank you very much for, for showing up here and, and please tell us what it was like or what it is like um, from a, a patient's perspective. Thank you. Um, it's horrific. Brian is absolutely right, as was Dr. Harper. It's horrific. Um, I had my first cluster headache in 1985. I was 19 years old and uh, woke up in the night I was studying I was a student at the time and um, I actually thought I was dying I thought I've got some sort of I don't know bleed some kind of hemorrhage I've got a tumor I could not understand what was causing this pain violent pain like nothing I'd ever experienced um, I was always healthy um, the usual kind of ailments, you know, growing up, chicken pox, that sort of stuff, colds. But um, th this was this just put me on my knees. 
and I couldn't understand what was happening to me. And um, to keep it short, I kind of bummed along like this for quite a long time, seeing um, different GPs. Um, and I became, in, in their words, a, a time waster, um, an attention seeker, a drug seeker. Um, and I wasn't any of those things. It was suggested to me on more than one occasion that perhaps it wasn't a neurologist I needed, but a psychiatrist. Um, and, you know, I, I saw all these various different specialists and that's why it's so important to make sure you see a headed specialist neurologist, um, someone who has a special interest in headache medicine. Um, I saw many neurologists who didn't know anything about cluster headache. Um, I was misdiagnosed with, with migraine for a very long time. So I took lots and lots of different medications. So I went from being a healthy young woman who didn't even pop a couple of aspirin for a headache, a regular headache, to someone who was taking everything. Um, because you always have this little glimmer of hope that, okay, if I try the next medication, that just might work. Um, and you keep telling yourself, I don't really want to try any more pharma medications, but okay, I'll just try this one more because that might be the one that does it for me. But deep down, you kind of know that it's not going to work. Um, and eventually I got a diagnosis of episodic cluster headache. Um, I, I had to see someone privately in, in London and within five minutes, um, because I was in a cluster episode at the time, he just took one look at me, he knew because my right eye was red. It, it was a lot smaller than my left eye. It was droopy. Um, I don't get the runny nostril, um, I get the blocked nostril and that's sometimes an indication for me that something's imminent um, when my nostril blocks. Um, so this was wonderful to know, actually, I don't have migraine, I, I have cluster headache, I now know what is wrong with me and what can I do about it. And, uh, and Brian knows um, from previous presentations that, you know, I tried everything and for a long time I was using an injectable sumatriptan very successfully. Um, within 10 or 15 minutes, I would go from smashing my head off of whatever hard surface was close by to being like I am now, you know, and it's almost like, my goodness, did, did that happen? But, you know, this stopped working for me or it wasn't as efficient. And I was having some um, other health issues, which may or may not have been related to the amount of medication I was using. And I got to a stage where I had a double-sided cluster attack. And I've still, to this day, only ever had four in, in all of the time that I've had cluster headaches. And um, I really wanted to end my life that day. You know, I thought, I can't live like this. I didn't have a life. It was out of control. My clusters were out of control. Um, I, I, I'm married. Um, to, to Peter would be my 31 years. We have two children, 30 and 23. My husband has never known me without clusters, nor have my children ever known me without clusters. And, you know, I was missing out on so much. I'm a very sociable person. I love people. I love to go out, I, I, you know, like to party. I, and I couldn't do any of that. I couldn't even make, um, things that the kids were doing at school, you know, concerts and things. Um, I, I couldn't even go to the grocery store without it being a military operation um, because it's embarrassing for someone to see you like that. Um, so, sorry, this always makes me emotional. Um, anyway, I reached out to Cluster Busters. I was put in touch with Cluster Busters through Ouch in the UK and um, they told me what to do and I spoke with Bob Walt who's the founder of Cluster Busters and um, when Cluster Busters was in its infancy 2002 there were not many members and Bob Walt 
saved my life. And I've said this hundreds of times, and I'm very proud to say it, Bob Wald saved my life. If it wasn't for him telling me, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do it with, and this is when you need to do it, I would not be here sharing my journey with you today. Um, I've just seen a message come up, Bob Wald is a dude. Bob Wald is a dude. He's a wonderful man. Um, and I owe my life to him. And I did what he told me to do, when he told me to do it, with what he told me to do it with. <coughs> and life changed for me in, in such a positive way. So I have been using psilocybin to very successfully control my cluster headaches for about the last 20 years, maybe a little bit longer. Probably for maybe 15 years, I've been doing it religiously um, because prior to that, trying to procure um, what I needed was not easy um, and, and it's easier now um, with you know the benefits of social media platforms you know we can all talk about how we can get our psilocybin. Um, I've also been working with our British government for the last about 18 months or so in trying to have psilocybin rescheduled for medicinal purposes. Now, for someone with cluster headache, it doesn't just help the clusters, but it also helps with the other symptoms that come with clusters. So the PTSD, the anxiety, the depression, it helps with that as well. It really has given me my life. It saved my life, but it's given me my life back. I am back to being the ANC that I always was. Um, also, for me, um, I got very involved with Clusterbus. I've been involved with them and, and supported them for many, many years. And about 18 months ago, um, I joined the board of Clusterbusters, and I'm very proud to do that. So advocacy for me is, is a huge thing, and that's why I'm working so closely to try and have psilocybin rescheduled. Brian is right, it is not harmful. Um, it's a Schedule 1, which basically says that it has no medicinal or therapeutic benefits, and I beg to differ. Um, the problem I have is the fact that I have to go underground and break the law to stay alive um, and, and to not want to end my life. Um, I still get cluster cycles, but and, and I don't believe I'm saying this, and every time I say it, I have to kind of shake myself. They are more gentle. Um, they're still not nice, but they are nowhere near as bad as, as they used to be. Each attack is um, a bit less severe. The um, length of my cycle has shortened dramatically. The intensity of each attack and the frequency of each attack. At some times I was having upwards of eight, nine, 10 attacks a day just coming out of one short break straight into another one. And they were all screamers, you know. So now I still get the odd screamer, but it's so much more manageable. Um, I was never a recreational drug user at university when everybody was having a little pop of this and a pop of that. I was the sensible, I'll drive, I'll make sure you all get home safely. Um, so, you know, it just wasn't my thing. And it was a huge big thing for me to use a psychedelic drug. And my first bust was very, very memorable when I had um, eight legs and I was a spider ballet dancer with Jesus on my ceiling. And that is a true story. Um, so watch your dosage. Um, but there's no need to go to Mars with the aliens. It's not like that. For me, it feels, you've got to feel something, but it feels like a couple of extra cocktails over your normal limit. You know, you're just a little bit detached from what's going on. Music sounds wonderful. I, take, I live in the country, about 20 miles from Glasgow City. I take my dogs to the fields behind my house and I look at all the beautiful shades of green in the fields and I admire the countryside and, and the wildlife that's on my doorstep and within six hours it's all over and my clusters are controlled. So that's my story. Um, 
shortened version, but psilocybin for me definitely has been the most successful treatment, not just for me, but for lots. I speak to lots of people. I get, you know, hundreds of messages a week, people reaching out um, to share. And I'll always share my story with anyone. Um, my email address is ainsley at clusterbusters.org. If you can put that into the chat, please. So if anybody has questions at the end and we don't have time, or you just want to reach out and talk a little further to me, I'm more than happy to, to speak with you um, at any time. Um, and thank you all for listening. Well, thank you so much, Ainsley. And, and something I, I always love to, to remind people is, uh, you know, it's not easy to be a, an advocate, to, to, you know, put your life out there to the public. Um, but when you do, when you advocate for yourself, you, you, you can't help but advocate for other people who are going through Absolutely. what you're going through. So you say, Bob Wald saved your life. And, and I, I know that you're doing the same for so many other people. So thank you so much for, for coming on here to speak with us. I, I really appreciate that. My pleasure. Um, okay. And Jonathan, I, I would love it if you could introduce more about Opus and, and what we've been working on here and, and more importantly, what, what you've been working on behind the scenes um, and, and done to connect all of us. Uh, I'd love to hear a bit about how Opus is tackling cluster headaches. Okay, great. Thanks, Spencer. Um, I thought I'd spend a few minutes, first of all, talking about, um, about, how, about the ethical aspects of the issue. And, uh, and this goes to the role and responsibilities of governments. Uh, and, and this touches very much on, uh, on our partnership and the work we're doing together. So if you think about it, I mean, governments, I think we all agree, are there first and foremost to support the well-being of their citizens. You know, we all want our societies to be governed according to some basic ethical principles. So most importantly, we want decisions to be based on evidence and reason, and we want laws to be fair and to be driven by compassion for those in need and especially with priority to those who are the most in need. So on the one hand, whenever possible, governments should take positive measures to help those in need. And that means um, includes promoting uh, effective health interventions. But governments should also never hinder people from helping themselves, unless there's a very strong risk that this will lead to even greater harm. Um, so Opus, as I mentioned earlier, um, our, our bigger picture goal is to ensure that governmental decision-making um, prioritizes the prevention of intense suffering. Um, so one of the projects we've been working on uh, was trying to improve access to morphine in lower income countries. So, uh, you know, we take morphine for granted in most high income countries, but in many parts of Africa, Latin America and Asia, people just can't get morphine. And there are various obstacles. There are legislative and administrative barriers, uh, lack of training of doctors, not enough doctors, um, unfounded fears, taboos, and, and most of these issues we can see as well with uh, the issue of psilocybin for cluster headaches. Um, so, you know, as we've heard from, from the other panelists, I mean, cluster headaches are a horrendously painful condition uh, for which standard medical treatments are inadequate. And we know that there's a strong body of evidence that uh, certain psychedelics of the indolamine family, which includes psilocybin, but also LSD and DMT, which, is, which many people find to be a very powerful and immediate abortive, um, can all provide dramatic benefits to patients. And so, um, you know, John Halpern was talking about clinical trials and it's clear that, um, well, first of all, there are some clinical trials ongoing and they will certainly give more precise information. Um, uh, you know, these are basically the gold standard when we're looking for, uh, to determine the effectiveness of a substance. Um, but you know, what we see with cluster headaches is that the evidence of effectiveness is already very strong, coming from hundreds, if not thousands of patients who have aborted attacks and even entire cycles and prevented new cycles from starting. And you know, while newly developed pharmaceuticals may have an unknown safety profile, psilocybin and LSD are both known to be quite safe with a long history of use. So you know, if we look at the situation, we've got an urgent situation where patients are in agony and we have substances that have been found to be enormously useful by many patients. And yet most governments, including the Canadian government, have laws on the books that restrict the production, the purchase, the possession, and even the medical prescription of these substances. 
And you know, the laws are in large part due to the misguided war on drugs that greatly overstated the harm uh, that these substances can cause. And then in fact has done great harm itself by treating individuals with dependence issues as criminals. So what does this mean in practice? It means that patients uh, may have difficulty to obtain these substances to self-treat and that those who do may risk prosecution. And it means that medical doctors who wish to prescribe these substances need to make a special request for an exemption. And this is a process that was already onerous um, and has now ground to a halt in Canada. So and, and another point is that the, the current legal status means that doctors may be wary of prescribing these substances, even if they technically can. And it also limits the ability of patient groups to successfully communicate with doctors um, about the advantages of these substances because of persistent taboos. So, you know, from an ethical perspective, um, it's self-evident that extreme suffering because of its inherent urgency has the highest priority call to action of any situation. And every cluster headache attack can be seen as a medical emergency, not life-threatening in itself, but so extreme that it causes patients to consider suicide and sometimes carry it out. And, you know, as John Halpern was mentioning before, doctors have a responsibility not just to cure illnesses, but to end the pain and suffering of their patients. So it's crucial that doctors be able to legally prescribe psilocybin for cluster headaches without bureaucratic obstacles and delays based on their own assessment of patient needs. And so this is really the core demand that Theracil and Opus are making of the Canadian government and, uh, and that we are also making of other governments. They establish clear regulations that provide physicians with this level of autonomy. And in addition, psilocybin or psilocybin containing mushrooms should be available for purchase at a known quality and dosage so that doctors and patients know exactly how much uh, the patients are consuming. Um, and at the same time, patients should never have to risk prosecution for self-treatment. Uh, and this is something that they may need to do as long as medical psilocybin is not readily available by prescription. So um, just you know, looking at the bigger picture, a policy of decriminalization and or legalization that treats drug dependence as a health issue rather than as a criminal justice issue would solve the problem. And this is something that Opus already uh, also strongly supports. So towards the end of last year, we produced a policy paper uh, signed by several prominent neurologists, including Brian um, and ethicists and researchers that basically pulls together existing evidence, including patient testimonials and advocates for the legalization of um, legalized access to psilocybin and related substances for the treatment of cluster headaches. And we've been collaborating with uh, several patient uh, and advocacy groups, including a group in Finland that is also trying to get the government to take cluster headaches seriously and change regulations. So that's basically what I, ha what I have to say. Uh, back to you, Spencer. Yeah, well, well, thank you very much, Jonathan. And you, I mean, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure being able to work with you and, and, and have, you know, the ideas that you've communicated and, and even just your knowledge and wisdom on how to make a case to the government for, you know, the inherent ethics in regulations. So, so thank you so much. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I kind of see that ethics are inherent in the regulations. It's the expression, you know, these regulations are the expression of our ethics. Uh, you know, when we, when we create regulations to allow people the right to die through medical assistance in dying. I mean, that's an expression of the ethics of, of a country, of a nation. Um, and, and I see similar here, the, there is a case to be made that if you have the right to die in Canada, well, shouldn't you have the right to try psilocybin? You know, and, and I think that moving away from when we're, we're forced to prosecute, persecute patients instead of support them, uh, for their, you know, illicit substance use it is definitely a matter of ethics. So thank you. And, and, you know, to, to kind of summarize this, I want to make sure we have time for Q and A here is, is I think that's where from an organization there are still, and, and I hope cluster busters and, and Opus can all, can all agree is that moving to a system where doctors are able to work with patients, uh, to make their own medical decisions and to use substances that would decrease suffering to have more resources to to investigate them and use them is, is what we're advocating for. So there are many Canadians that we've been supporting uh, with section 56 applications so that they can use psilocybin for their cluster busting. Um, and unfortunately, many of those exemptions have gone ignored. 
which is a real shame because uh, the suffering among Canadians, whether they're actively palliative, whether they're in remission, whether they have chronic pain, whether they have cluster headaches, addiction, PTSD, uh, you know, who better than the doctor and the patient to determine the level of suffering. And, and when suffering is that bad, I think compassion access is necessary. Um, so thank you so much, Jonathan, for everything you've done to help. And, and Holly, I want to turn it over to you to direct some questions. I know we've only got about five minutes left here, but let's get through as many as we can. Uh, and we'll make sure that uh, upon closing up this webinar that we do uh, record all those, those questions so that we can get responses to those who have asked them. Awesome. Thanks, Spencer. And thank you, everybody, for uh, showing up today and for all our panelists. Um, so grateful to hear you all speak, truly. Um, there's a ton of questions and there's four minutes left. Um, so I'm going to direct this to Dr. Magimi, um, just because I know you're in this, the States and I, I don't want to give out your email as well. So um, I'm, this question is, I'm a psychiatrist, uh, wondering if you're aware of any specific overlap, i.e. increased mortality rates between cluster headaches and depression or suicide. Also, are there any concern for analgesia dependence, rebound headaches, or pain with psilocybin treatment for cluster headaches? Um, to take it in reverse, <clears throat> so psilocybin has been shown to result in a headache in the aftermath, and especially in those I think who have a migraineous background. Uh, so it's not that's not cluster. That's just a they think of it like of an epiphenomena of coming off. Um, um, a, a dose, a, a, it's dose dependent. It's not something that it concerns cluster patients primarily because they're after a more prolonged remission period and they're quite willing to accept even a, a bad cluster hit after dosing if they get the remission. Um, so, so that's how it could cause headache temporarily. It is a single episode post dose. And in cluster, you're dosing infrequently. Um, and uh, rebound headache, no, not for cluster. No is the answer to that. And the issue of the relationship between cluster and depression and suicide. Well, you know, we've all know people and Bob, Bob Wald, the head of cluster busters has counseled at least six people who tragically, unfortunately, have subsequently taken their life. Um, so that's a reality. Um, and depression and PTSD, they do appear more common. I mean, when you look at um, population studies of that, it, it is it's very common in the cluster population, especially the more burdened. Most patients are episodic and go through months without any attacks. The 10, 15% who are chronic, i.e. don't get a prolonged benefit, you risk losing everything, everything, your social relationships, your job security, homelessness, uh, and ability to support yourself for a couple of attacks a day. If you have one attack a day, you can generally do okay. Uh, but there is a tremendous threat there. But I think I've answered some of what you've thrown at me. That was perfect, yeah. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, and I think there's been some discussion about how can these psilocybin experiences, especially if, if somebody's using a high dose, how can you ensure a safe container for using psilocybin in a high dose to cluster bust? And does that have a connection to the need for regulations? Does somebody else want to take that? Or, or I mean, a, a safe container? You mean so, so somebody won't, won't yeah. be using it? Uh, a safe container, meaning, you know, for, for many people using psychedelics, it can be a scary experience. You're going deep into your psyche, even though you're using this for a physical condition. How can you make sure that it's not scary and not a bad trip? Well, set and setting, enormously important. I think maybe Ainsley could comment on that because an awful lot, and as we get older, of course, we're a lot more wiser on these things. Um, but set, your mindset and the setting in which you do it are enormously important. Ainsley? Yeah, absolutely. I 100% agree with that. Um, I've actually delayed busts um, in the past because I've just not been uh, in the right headspace, if you like. Maybe, you know, I've had three or four nights with, with no sleep uh, and, you know, back-to-back -back attacks, not the best time to bust. So I think uh, for anyone who would be embarking on busting, 
it's really important your setting and to have a sitter with you for the first time, someone that you trust, um, someone that you feel comfortable with, also to do it in your own home or a place where you're comfortable um, is mega important as well. But so your location is important, but I think the most important thing is where you are in your own head, because, you know, it, it is a um, thought provoking medication. It's that simple. It does make you think very deeply, even on a lighter dose. And to be honest with you, I don't think there's, I've taken a lighter dose and I've taken a heavier dose. And I don't think there's a huge difference. Um, and uh, the more you do, you learn to control your thoughts. You become, as you become more experienced in busting, if you hit some bad thoughts, it used to freak me out a little bit in the early days. And again, I was taught by those more experienced than me at that time, you know, divert your attention, put some music on, put the TV on, put a comedy on, think about something else. And it's very easy to divert your attention. So I would say those were really important factors um, for a first time buster. Um, and even for an experienced buster, you know, your location, um, and your mindset is really important. And if you don't feel it's the right time to do it, then delay it for, an, for another day or, you know, whenever you feel you're in a good headspace. Um, and I really can't emphasize that enough. But it's not scary. It's really not scary. It's, if you go with it, it's a pleasant experience. And if you do hit that little bad thought, then, think of something happy, think of something else and just go with it. To be quite honest with you, I'm not particularly keep on busting. Um, it's not, that might sound really strange, but it's not something that I can completely 100% embrace. Over the years, I've got better with it. I would never do it out with my own home ever because um, I just wouldn't be comfortable with that. Um, but, but I do it because it's what keeps me alive and it's a very small sacrifice to feel a little woo woo for six or seven hours um, to get a really long remission. Uh, and I used to not get long remissions. I'd have two cycles a year lasting anywhere between eight weeks and eight months. Um, and using psilocybin, I usually get about two years. I think my longest remission has been two years, two weeks, and it was glorious. So yeah, if anybody's thinking of doing this, I am proof that this works and it works well and it works better than anything I've ever tried before. And I've tried pretty much everything pharma wise. Nikki, can I just make, make a point that just for the audience who are not familiar that uh, really in, in, with this, for those who respond, it really is infrequent use. Um, yeah. Some folks think uh, patients would have to take it on a regular uh, daily or every other day. That's not the case. It's as little as every three months for yeah. prolonged benefit. Um, yeah, so you would take it in a cycle. If you did get a cycle, you'd be trying to break that cycle and you would be busting every five days. Some people do it every four. I do every five until that cycle breaks. And then you would do what we call a maintenance bust, which is a one-off bust. I usually do mine roughly about four times a year, but it's really indicative of the kind of activity that I have. If I have any activity after my cycle's over, I, when I'm in a remission period, I bust immediately. You know, I don't take any chances. You cannot be complacent with this. You have to commit. And if you commit, your life will improve. For sure. Well, thank you so much, Ainsley and, and Brian and Jonathan. Unfortunately, we've got to close this, this webinar up now. Um, I certainly know that if anyone out there in the audience is looking into uh, learn more about cluster headaches, um, they can visit Theracil. Um, I guess uh, Brian, Ainsley and, and Jonathan, where else can they go to learn more about uh, cluster busting? Well, um, the Cluster Busters website um, and the uh, the files and forums 
uh, from there. Very, very useful. Awesome. And Holly's just thrown that in the chat. And that there's a book by Ashley Hattle, H-A-T-T-L-E on Amazon. She's a patient, an advocate, uh, married to uh, someone with cluster headache as well as having it herself. And she wrote really the definitive book for patients who with cluster headache. Wonderful. Okay, well, again, Jonathan, Brian, Ainsley, thank you so much for coming to this webinar. It, that is incredibly informative. Uh, we're gonna have this webinar recorded so that we will be able to share it with others. Um, and I, I wish you all the absolute best of luck with Cluster Busters and, and look forward to, to working with you in the future. And same goes to you, Jonathan. I, I really hope that uh, this webinar did its job and informed more Canadians about uh, psilocybin use for cluster headaches. So, so thank you all so much. Thank, thank you, you, folks. Hey, thanks. Thank thanks you. Everyone. Lovely to see you all. Be safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.